Good morning. My name's Joe. I'm doing the Bible reading this morning. Uh, we're reading from Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16. It's on page 987 in the Pew Bibles. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius a day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour did the same thing. At about the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages beginning with the ones hired, last, last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who is hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So, the last will be first, and the first will be last. Thanks, Joe. Do you keep that passage open in front of you? You should have a, an outline on the inside of your sheet, if that would help you as we go along. And we're going to start with uh, a big and important, profound question. How do you share a cake that's the big question we're grappling with this morning. How do you share a cake? How do you share one cake evenly and fairly between people so that everyone is happy and no one feels like they got the small bit? I grew up with one brother, and so the answer for us was actually fairly easy. One person cuts, the other person chooses. We've done that, right? Okay, so both people are happy because the people who cut would have been happy with either piece, and the person who didn't cut gets to choose their favorite. But what if there are three of you? What if there are five, 12, or 50 people who all need to share the same cake? Well, if that's the kind of question that keeps you lying awake at night, then I have good news. Mathematicians Harris Aziz and Simon McKenzie published a paper in 2016 called an envy-free cake-cutting protocol for any number of people. <laughs> These men are heroes. Uh, there is a slight drawback. If you have, say, six people, then using their protocol requires you to make in the region of 100 trillion cuts to be absolutely guaranteed that everyone gets their fair share, but still, good effort. Now, why did Dr. Aziz and Dr. McKenzie write this paper? Well, probably because that's what counts as fun for mathematicians, but I wrote it, I think, because our world is obsessed with fairness. We hate the idea of life being unfair, don't we? whether it's our children complaining that their sister got to watch her favourite TV show and they didn't, or whether it's workers going on strike because they're not being paid or treated fairly, or whether it's people writing books and articles to raise awareness of historic injustices. We all seem to have a desire for things to be right and just and fair. We might disagree on what that means and, and how we get it, but we all want it. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis calls this the first law of human nature, that all of us believe this universe should be fair, that it should operate on principles of justice. And he argues that that is evidence that deep down, 
in all of our hearts, we know that this universe is run by a personal God who is right and fair and just. After all, if this universe was simply a chance accident of random scientific processes and mutations and things like that, then we wouldn't expect the world to be just. We just expect randomness and chaos and unfairness, but we don't. And as we'll see today, Lewis is right to point us to a righteous and fair God. We'll see today that not only is fairness and justice a basic human instinct, it's also a godly instinct grounded in the character of the God of the Bible and of his son, Jesus Christ. However, the message of today's passage is going to be challenging for us. The message is this, that if you insist on fairness and justice, if that is the overriding concern of your life, if that's the thing you're passionate about above all else, then you're going to miss out. You'll miss out something crucial and fundamental and central to the character of God and of his son, Jesus Christ. You'll miss out on the greatest gift God wants to give you. Indeed, you'll miss out on eternal life. It really is a big question, it turns out. So let's pray together as we begin. Father, as we turn to your words, we know that we need your revelation. We need your light. We need your truth to shine into our dark and twisted and sinful hearts. Please speak to us today. Please challenge us. Please change us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if we're going to understand this passage, passage, we first need to understand the context. Jesus is still responding to two big questions that he's just been asked. Cast your eyes back and we'll see them. The first is there in chapter 19, verse 16. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? That's the first question. And we saw last week, this is actually a brilliant question, a very important question, indeed the most important question anyone can ever ask. How do I get eternal life? How do I make it into the kingdom of heaven? How do I restore my broken relationship with God so that I can be accepted into the new creation forever? A brilliant question. But the man who asked it had entirely the wrong idea about the answer. He thought the answer was in what he could do in his service for God, his work for him, his obedience to the commandments, which he was pretty proud of. But as Jesus gently and skillfully probed into this man's heart, we saw that in fact this man fell far short, impossibly short, of God's standards. Actually, he was an idolater in his heart, captured and ensnared by his greed. And so for him to get eternal life, it would take nothing less than a miracle of God to humble his heart and cast himself on the mercy of King Jesus. He could not earn eternal life. He would only receive it like a little child as a gift. That's the first question Jesus was dealing with. But the second comes in verse 27 of uh, of chapter 19. Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you, what then will there be for us? It's difficult, I think, for us to read Peter's tone in this question. He could be saying something like this, look, Jesus, following you is great, but it's, it's really hard, and we've sacrificed a lot. Is it worth it? Or possibly it's a bit sharper than that. Jesus, look, we've given up a lot for you. What do we get in return? Well, however Peter's asking that question, Jesus last week began to answer it. He said that whatever a disciple might give up for Jesus is nothing compared to what they will receive. In verse 29, Jesus said that whoever gives up one thing will receive a hundred times as much in return. God is an abundant and gracious giver. He is no man's debtor. And those, verse 30 who seem to be losing out in this life for following Jesus, who are the last and the least, will find themselves first in the kingdom of heaven. Whereas those who seem to be thriving and winning in this life will miss out in the life to come. But Jesus knows that his disciples haven't learned their lesson just yet. There's more they need to grasp. You'll notice in 20 verse 16 that he repeats the same lesson. So the last will be first and the first will be last. This story that he tells, which is a masterful, genius piece of storytelling, is going to drive home the same lesson for us, whatever question we're currently asking. 
whether we're like the rich young man asking, how can I gain eternal life? Or whether you're counting the cost, wondering if following Jesus is really worth it. Or whether you've been a Christian for a while and the hardship of that is starting to bite. Wherever we are, this story will answer our questions by reorienting our hearts to the king of God's kingdom and showing us what he's all about. So let's dive into the story, which is a story first about work and wages. See how it begins in verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. This is actually the first of three parables that Jesus tells in this gospel about life in a vineyard, and that setting is no coincidence. Matthew is the great gospel writer of fulfillment. He's constantly telling his readers that one part of Jesus' life or another fulfills some Old Testament prophecy or vision or idea. And so he expects his first readers to know the Old Testament, and the better we know it, the more we'll understand what he's doing and what he's talking about. And if we do know the Old Testament, that mention of the word vineyard should ring a huge bell for us. In Isaiah 5, the vineyard is the metaphor God uses to talk about his people, Israel. In that chapter, he describes how he lovingly created the vineyard, tended it, protected it, did everything he could for it. And yet when he returned to gather the grapes, he found it unfruitful. Here's how the story ends on the screen in Isaiah 5, verse 7. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. And so when Jesus starts talking about a landowner or a father or a master planting and tending a vineyard, we know what he's talking about. He's talking about God himself saving and building and growing his people. But also when we hear about a vineyard, we already suspect things are not going to be straightforward, that they perhaps won't end well for the people in the vineyard, that there's going to be a sting in the tail. Well, let's read the first part of the story, starting at verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, You also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one's hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired, going on to the first. Well, so far, so straightforward. We have a landowner, a landowner who needs laborers for the grape harvest, and clearly he has a lot of work to do. The harvest is good, perhaps. The work is urgent. So he goes out several times to the marketplace to recruit some people. This is all normal, bog-standard hiring practices in ancient Israel. He heads out first thing in the morning, about 6 a.m., and yes, I checked the sunrise times in Jerusalem in the grape harvesting month of June for you. You're welcome. And already, he finds people eager for work. These are obviously the organized and keen workforce. They're already out of bed. They're up for a day's labor. And so the the landowner agrees their day's wages, a denarius. And again, that is absolutely bog standard. That would have required no negotiation whatsoever. A denarius was the basic day labourer's wage. You could buy around five big loaves of bread with it. Your family can can live on a denarius a day. It's a good, fair wage. That's not enough workers. So verse 3, he goes out again. At the third hour, that is 9 a.m., find some more. Notice that this time he doesn't specify how much he'll pay. He simply says, verse 4, that he'll pay whatever is right. He will give a just and fair wage for the amount of work they're going to do. And these workers appear to take that at face value. Perhaps this landowner has the reputation of being a good boss to work for, and and so they too head into the vineyard to work. He goes out again at 12 noon and 3 p.m., the 6th and 9th hours, and apparently makes the same deal. In fact, so keen is he for workers that he even goes out at the 11th hour, 5 p.m., as the sun is setting, and finds more people. Look at that again, verse 6. 
About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing around all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired as they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. We should note that when um, Jesus says doing nothing, it doesn't necessarily mean that this last crowd has been bone idle. But clearly there's something a bit less than top quality about this final group. Why haven't they found work yet? Why have they been overlooked by everyone else? Perhaps they're weaker. Perhaps they don't have the best reputation. Perhaps they've turned up late to the marketplace and missed the best employment opportunities. Either way, here they are, still in the marketplace, desperate to, just, to get just one hour's work. Did you notice that they don't ask about pay and the landowner doesn't talk about pay? He says, right, in you go, get to work. They are, after all, in no position to negotiate. It's one hour's work at whatever wage they can get, or it's nothing. And at the 12th hour, the end of the day, the landowner gets the men together to receive their wages. That, by the way, is commanded in the law of Moses, that workers are paid before sundown so that they don't go hungry overnight. They can provide a meal for their families before they go to sleep. And so what do we learn about this landowner in these first eight verses? So far, we've learned he's a model of fairness. He gives lots of opportunities to work. He appears to treat his workers well. There's hints he has a good reputation. And he's perhaps prepared to take a chance on people who others have overlooked. And he's a man who pays a fair wage. In other words, so far, it's it's quite a boring story. Perhaps boring is a bit too strong. It's just a very, very normal story, isn't it? It's what we see in our world all the time. It's basic. You work and you get paid for it. You pay and you get work for it. It's the way our economy works. It's the way our world works. If you want something, you've just got to go out there and earn it. We've already seen what happens when we take that insight, that observation about the way the world usually works and apply it to a relationship with God. We've seen it in the rich young man, haven't we? He's worked, he has worked for his riches, we assume, and he's worked at his relationship with God. He has striven to keep the commandments. He has done, in his own estimation, everything to please God. He was such a model of godliness and success that the disciples assumed that if he couldn't be saved, then no one could. And yet when he came face to face with God in the person of Jesus, he went away sad. Something about this basic idea of the world that you get what you work for, that you earn what you need, doesn't quite fit with Jesus and the kingdom of heaven. And our first small hint of that is in the tiny detail in verse 8. The landowner insists that the foreman distributes the wages in a slightly weird way. The last are paid first, and the first are paid last. Hmm. It's a bit odd, isn't it? Let's see why this happens as the story moves on to grace and grumbling, grace and grumbling. After eight verses where, frankly, not a lot of interest has happened, all of a sudden we get an absolute roller coaster of emotion in the next four. Let's read those from verse nine. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. Let's ride this uh, roller coaster of emotion together. First, think about the journey that the 11th hour workers have been on. For whatever reason, they weren't picked up until the very last minute. So think first about the anxiety and the stress of that. They're hungry, their families are relying on them to bring something home, and with an hour to go, they've got absolutely nothing. No work, no money, no hope. Then they're suddenly thrown a lifeline. An hour's work, it won't be much, it's going to be the easy bit in the cool of the evening, they probably won't get paid very much for that, but but it's something, a glimmer of hope for a handful of grain. But when it comes to the payment, bafflingly, ridiculously, they get a whole denarius, a full day's pay for one hour's work. And so what joy, what relief, what gratitude they must feel. What a blessing for them. 
They would return to their families absolutely walking on air and with a song of praise and thanksgiving in their hearts. The landowner has been massively gracious towards them. He's given them far more than they can expect or deserve, and he's been hugely compassionate to them and their families, providing for their needs when he really didn't have to. What a roller coaster! What a day they've had! That's the 11th hour workers. And Jesus now turns our attention to the people hired first. Hang on, they start to think to themselves in verse 10. If they've got a whole denarius for one hour's work, and we've worked 12 hours, this is brilliant. We are going to get an absolute payday here. And then the ninth hour workers are called up and get a denarius. And the sixth hour workers are called up and get a denarius. Can you feel the joy of operating? Can you feel the adrenaline drain away and be replaced with a sense of disappointment and then horror and then anger? And then the hammer blow hits, end of verse 10, they get a denarius, just like everybody else, just like the people who only worked half the day, just like those lazy fools who only worked one hour. And so after the grace comes the grumbling. Look again at verse 12 and see the complaint These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us. Do you see that? Those guys have done basically nothing, and we have absolutely grafted our socks off, and you have treated them as if they were like us. You've treated them as if they have worked as hard as we have. Now, I'm not going to ask for hands up, but who here thinks they have a point? I think they do. And in fact, I don't think we'll understand this passage unless we start by agreeing with these early rising, hard working, justice loving laborers. They have got a point. And emotionally, I know exactly where they're coming from, don't you? I would feel precisely the same. How can it be fair? How can it be right to pay the same wage for different work? To pay the people who've done an hour's easy pickings the same as those who've done a full day of back-breaking work in the scorching heat of a Middle Eastern summer. You know, call it grace and compassion if you like, but it's scandalous. It is outrageous. Do you get it? Do you feel it? Would you have the same complaint? Would you respond to grace with grumbling? Have you responded to grace with grumbling? Have you seen people apparently just look their way through life, getting for free what you worked hard for? Have you seen people who have something that you desperately want and there just doesn't seem to be any difference between you? Have you burned with anger at the unfairness of it all? And have you looked with resentment and envy towards those who are better off than you for apparently no reason whatsoever? That other Christian in church whose life seems to be so smooth and easy, whose family life is straightforward, who's capable and gifted and you're struggling and suffering and it's all you can do to make it to church and listen to a sermon. How is that fair? Or turning the tables the other way, if you're the one who's capable and gifted and you're serving your heart out and other people just turn up late and leave early and you're left picking up the pieces... Envy and resentment are equal opportunities sins. They don't depend on circumstances. We can all fall into them. So have you felt it? Have you turned that resentment and anger and envy towards God? In your heart of hearts, have you said to him, it is not fair? Why have you treated him or her like that and treated me like this? Haven't I worked for you? Haven't I done enough for you? What have I done to be treated so badly? And what have they done to be treated so well? Now, if you've never had that thought, then you're a better person than me. I've I've thought that. And in one sense, it's absolutely natural that we should think that. We live in a world which is built on an economy of works, an economy of justice. You get what you pay for, you get what you work for, you earn what you need. And when we see that subverted or inverted, that can make us very cross. And so we cry out to God, who has a reputation, by the way, like the landowner for justice and fairness, and we say to him, what are you doing? What are you playing at? 
Well, if we instinctively get where these first hour workers are coming from, we need to hear the landowner's gentle and gracious answer to them. Let's turn finally to the king and the kingdom. <clears throat> Look at verse 30. But he answered one of them, friends, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Interestingly, Jesus doesn't speak to the whole group of workers. Do you notice that? This is not the time for high-level talks with a collectivized union who are threatening industrial action. No, the issue is what is going on in each individual's heart. And so he singles out one of them. He makes it personal for him, and therefore, as readers, he makes it personal for us. And did you notice what he calls him? He calls him friend. He reaches out with grace and compassion towards a grumbling man, to someone like us, grappling envy and entitlement and resentment. And the first thing he says is very simple. He, he's not being unfair. This is not an injustice at all. He's being scrupulously fair. He is doing what is right. They agreed to work for a day for a denarius. They've worked for a day. And they've got a denarius. There is no injustice here. The landowner is still a fair employer. He has kept his word, kept his promise, fulfilled his contract, held up his side of the bargain. So what's the problem? The landowner puts his finger on the problem in verse 14. Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? Why did the landowner pay the 11th hour workers the same as the first hour workers? The answer is simple in one sense, and it's in two parts. Firstly, because it's his money to do what he wants with. Notice that all the way through the story, the landowner is completely in charge of everything. It's his vineyard. It's his harvest. He goes out and hires the workers. He sets the terms, and his money pays the wages. Everything good in this story finds its source in him. And as he reminds the grumbling laborers, he has the freedom to do what he wants with what is his. He will never give what, what is less, sorry, he will never give less than what is right and fair. But if he wants to give more, well, that's his prerogative. The laborers need to know that the landowner is not playing a zero-sum game. That is, his generosity towards others doesn't make him mean towards them. It's not sort of on a big balanced scales. The way he's treated the 11th hour workers has not made any difference at all to how he's treated the first hour workers. They are no worse off than they expected to be, and they've got exactly what they deserve. But the landowner is the landowner. In fact, in verse 8, as he's about to distribute the wages, his title subtly changes. He no longer is called the landowner in verse 8, but literally the Lord of the vineyard. He is supremely free to do what he wants because the laborers, sorry, the vineyard is his and the laborers are under his authority. He can do what he wants. But there's another reason why he paid the 11th hour workers the same as the first hour workers. Not only is he free to do what he wants, he's also generous. He's a generous man. Literally in verse 15, he says, I am good. He's a good man. Do you remember last week when the rich young man came to Jesus and said, what one good thing do I need to do? Jesus replied to him, verse 17 was this, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who's good. That is, if you want to know about the kingdom, don't think in terms of good deeds. Think first in terms of the good gods. If you want to understand the kingdom, if you want to know the way to eternal life, if you want to know what God is like, you need to know first and foremost that God is good. And that has rubbed both ways in this, these chapters. He is good, and first, that is bad news for us. Because no matter how good we are, we can never be good enough for him. That's what the rich young man had to learn. He is so good that it's bad news. But he is so good that it is also good news. In fact, it's the best news ever because his goodness overflows in generosity towards people who don't deserve it, towards rich young men who have idolized money their whole lives, 
towards scared, weary disciples who worry that they're getting in over their heads and whether being a Christian is really worth the cost. Towards 11th hour workers who are not very special and not very clever and haven't really done very much. He pours out to them in this passage 12 times what they've earned. In the last passage, he promised 100 times what any disciple could give up. He is generous. He is good. And so his question to the first workers is a pretty cutting one in verse 15. Are you envious because I'm generous? The Greek for this uh, envious idea is a rather strange idiom. The landowner asks, is your eye evil because I'm good? That's the literal translation of verse 15. Is your eye evil because I am good? Having an evil eye, a bad eye, was apparently a way of talking about envy. And you can imagine, can't you, sort of narrowed, squinting eyes looking at other people, other more successful or fortunate people with envy and resentment and hatred, giving them the evil eye. But it's actually not the first time Jesus has used this expression. I wonder if you'd leave something in Matthew 20 and turn back with me to Matthew 6. The page number's going to uh, appear on the screen. Thanks, guys. 971. <clears throat> And we'll see that the last time Jesus talked about an evil eye or a bad eye. Matthew 6, <clears throat> verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, evil, same word, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We've already met a man, haven't we, who was trying to serve both God and money, someone who was storing up treasures on earth, who could not give up his wealth and his lifestyle to follow Jesus. And that rich young man in Matthew 19 proved Jesus' words in Matthew 6 right. He couldn't serve two masters. He ended up hating Jesus and loving his money. And here we see in those first hour workers where that ends up, an envious and evil eye an eye which resents and complains and grumbles in the name of justice, can end up, verse 23, with a whole body full of darkness, with a heart that is completely resistant to the light and the grace and the compassion of the Lord of the vineyards. You see, Jesus said you can't serve both God and money. We can draw another conclusion from that. We can say that another way. The economy of grace... And the economy of works cannot coexist. We can live a life and we can treat God and others in a way which is all about me and what I can do and what I can earn, which is about the strictest principles of justice. We can live that way if you like. And justice is no bad thing. But if we live by justice, if we insist on justice, the Bible tells us we will die by justice. If we say to God, I only want what's coming to me, I don't want charity, I don't want handouts, and I don't want anyone else to have an unfair advantage, just give everyone what they deserve, then we will find, to our horror, that he gives us what we deserve. Did you notice the little detail back in Matthew 20, verse 14? What does he say to the first workers when he pays them? Take your pay and go. As Jesus says at the beginning of chapter 6 about the Pharisees who trumpeted their good works, they've received their rewards in full. And so they are sent away from the presence of the Lord of the vineyard. There is the economy of works in action. But the economy of grace is fundamentally different. Yes, it is just. Yes, it is fair. God never gives less than what is deserved. But he is the good God who just loves to give more. And that is very good news for us. You see, some of us in this room will have worked hard for God. We will have served and sacrificed and given, and that is not nothing. 
But what we receive from God in return is not a matter of contractual obligation. It's not what we've earned. It's not a right or an entitlement. The vineyard does not run on the economy of works. It runs on the economy of grace. We must not be like that rich young man who thinks that because of our obedience, we've earned our wages from the Lord, or like Peter indignantly pointing out to Jesus exactly how much we've sacrificed for him, or like those first workers begrudging others who seem to have received more than we have for less expended effort. If we want to do that, if we want to live life like that and put ourselves first and look down on those who turned up last, then Jesus' warning in verse 16 may end up applying to us. But if we understand the economy of grace, we ought to know that we are all 11th hour workers. If we have come to know Jesus, if God has worked that miracle in our hearts to humble our pride and cause us to cast ourselves on his mercy, then we have received much, much more than we've ever earned. When we receive good things from God, we ought to be like those 11th hour workers, baffled and surprised and overjoyed to get what we did not work for and what we could not possibly earn. When we receive a blessing from God, we ought to say, where did that come from? Not, yes, thank you very much, I earned that. No, it's all grace. And when others receive grace, when people who are less fortunate than us or different to us or less apparently deserving than us become Christians or receive blessings... Well, what happens if we live by the economy of works? If we live by the economy of works, then that'll make our eyes evil. But the economy of grace will make our hearts glad. How wonderful that the God who was generous to me hasn't finished yet. How wonderful that he has the freedom to do what he wants with what is his. How wonderful that he's not run out of blessing. That when his, his, he blessed me, his bank account didn't end up empty. He can keep giving and giving and giving to others without ever taking anything from me. How can I be envious when he is so generous? How can my eye be evil when he is so good? Brothers and sisters, isn't this liberating? Isn't this freeing for us? To not be the person who counts the pennies and keeps track of exactly what I deserve and exactly what I, others deserve and jealously guarding what I have earned and enviously resenting those who have more than me. How exhausting to be the world's policeman or the world's judge or, heaven forfend, the world's accountant. By all means, be righteously concerned that others in this world are getting less than they deserve. Be righteously furious about that, but don't be personally envious because others are getting more. How exhausting and poisonous to our souls. And how joyous to know that we deserve nothing. And yet God's grace can supply abundantly more than we need, than we could ever ask or ever imagine. As we conclude, I want to point out one tiny detail of the passage that we might have missed. Did you notice how Jesus introduced the story in verse 1? He doesn't say, the kingdom of heaven is like this story. Nor does he say the kingdom of heaven is like this vineyard. Instead, he says the kingdom of heaven is like this man. It's like this man, this landowner, the lord of the vineyard, the one who is both just and good, both fair and generous, the one who welcomes early rising, go-getting hard workers, and the one who welcomes rubbish latecomers who no one else wants. The one who is never less than just, but is always more. The one who loves to be gracious and compassionate. The one who shows grace to shirkers and grace to grumblers. The kingdom is like the king. The kingdom is like Jesus. Like Jesus who is on the way to the cross to receive our wages in full. To get what we actually deserve. As Paul said later, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so back to those two questions we began with. Are you today wondering what you need to do to inherit eternal life? Well, here's your answer. Come to Jesus. Come to your King. Come to the Lord of the vineyard. Bow the knee 
and ask for his mercy. You see, he is good. Too good for you to impress him with your works, but good enough to shower you with grace to cover your sins. What about that other question? What if you're wondering whether following Jesus is worth it? Whether the sacrifices and the struggles and the hardship and the work will ever be repaid? Well, if that is you, come again to the cross of Christ. See what your king, the Lord of the vineyard, gave up for you. The missionary and explorer David Livingstone gave his life to Africa. He devoted himself to the abolition of the slave trade and to the spreading of the good news of Jesus. And he was once asked by some students at Cambridge about the sacrifices he'd made. This is what he said. It is emphatically no sacrifice. Say rather, it is a privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering or danger, now and then, with the foregoing of the common conveniences and charities of this life, may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver and the soul to sink, but let this only be a moment for a moment. All these are nothing when compared with the glory which shall be revealed in and for us. I never made a sacrifice. Now there's a man who understood that the kingdom is like the king. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that your kingdom is like your king, like Jesus Christ. Thank you that Jesus is so good, that he is so generous, that he is just and fair and never gives less what is deserved, but always loves to give more. Thank you that we have received far, far more than we could ever earn or expect or hope. And thank you that you have blessed others with more uh, than they deserve. And we, we, we would love to pray heart, with heart, with heart, with um. With heartfelt joy, we would love to pray, thank you for giving that other person more than me. And Father, we often struggle to pray that prayer. And so would you soften and change our hearts that we can be joyous when you are generous rather than envious. And please make us glad to be in the kingdom of the good and generous king. In Jesus' name, amen.